This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. When you look at your vehicle, think of MPB. Need to get rid of your ride? Donate it by calling 877-MPB, the number four car. Need to have some work done on your truck? Listen to AutoCorrect Thursdays at 10, Saturdays at 11. An MPB license plate reminds you that MPB is with you wherever you go. Go to your county office and ask for an MPB car tag. MPB and cars, better together. From MPB Think Radio, this is Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotter janderson president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. We'd all love to have more money to invest. Before you can find ways to get your money to grow, you have to save money. Budgeting can help you do that. If you need a little help writing out a plan to spend your money each week, this is the show for you. If you need a little help investing that money, we can help there too. Contact us by phone. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464. Contact us by email. The address, it's money at mpbonline.org. So good morning. We are going to start with Ryder with the latest financial news. Good morning. So uh, my financial news is a little more personal. My wife and I have started looking at kind of longer term investments because we brought home our first child last week. Oh, wow. Um, Congratulations. And, yes, thank you. <laughs> and and she got her first cash gift from her great grandmother. <laughs> uh, aren't grandparents great? And so, of course, the question becomes, where do we put that? You know, do we put that in an education savings account? Do we, uh, if we leave it in cash, we, you know, we expect that to be kind of the lowest returning. It's not going to keep up with inflation. And, you know, how is she going to budget that in the future? All sorts of things tying in with today's program. Well, and Ryder has just <laughs> suffered a huge hole in his budget, let me tell you, with this little person coming home, and a girl, no less. <laughs> yeah. So um, we are all very excited at New Perspectives and uh, for this addition to his family. And, uh, you know, he's pretty private, Kevin, so we... You know, he, he made us all keep it a secret for a while, but uh, we're all just bursting with pride for him. Yeah, that's exciting news. And again, congratulations, Ryder, on, on starting your family. Thank you. You know, um, my brother, uh, and I told this to Ryder before we came on the air, but my brother went up to uh, visit my mom in upstate New York, and my sister was having hip replacement surgery, so he was there to help her out as well. Scheduled to return Sunday night, 930. Flight got canceled. He calls me back. Uh-oh. Okay, now I'm supposed to arrive Sunday afternoon. Nope, didn't make it. Mm. Uh, he's supposed to arrive Monday at 3.30. I get a call. No, I'm sorry. I'm stuck in oh, Charlotte. No. Now it's today at noon. So, mm. wow, Three. what awful. I mean. Yeah, I'm getting ready to get on a plane on Thursday. And uh, the return flight has already been adjusted. So if everything goes perfectly we won't land till midnight so i may be Lo- love to- landing at midnight mm. uh, uh, yeah <laughs> it's gonna be crazy um maybe some quick thoughts from both of you do you think this is going to have any long-term negative consequences for the airline industry well i think things are going to slow down and certainly we've had this rush of getting out of the house mm-hmm. We were ready to travel, and uh, a lot of the airline executives have said they think, you know, by the end of this summer, we'll start to see some slowing of that with a decline in oil prices. And, of course, that we've seen a decline in prices at the pump for a month now. Um, that's going to help with pricing. But more than anything, I think maybe we're just starting to calm down. We've gotten it out of our system. Yeah, I think that's one of the interesting things. Uh, airline tickets are higher than ever. I was just trying to pull that up with the uh, rate of inflation on just the airline tickets uh, has been recently, and that's for a number of factors, uh, mostly fuel. Everyone knows yeah. that's gone up so much. And then at the same time, you have summer. Traditionally, people are 
are traveling a lot more. And then, as Nancy alluded to, we, we've been uh, traveling less than normal for the past two years. And so this is really, I don't know what the numbers are. I should have looked those up. But people are really wanting to get out and about more. I think the high ticket price and the crowded planes is, is just good evidence that it's, it's not slowing people down right now. Uh, but like Nancy said, people might, people might chill on it after this. They might say, okay, that was a good, expensive trip. Let's, let's, we have to budget our next one, though. Well, and that brings us to inflation. We all know that's what we're talking about constantly. The latest numbers show inflation at an uh, over 9% rate. That is very concerning. Um, but we had a couple of things going on. You know, a common definition of inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. Mm -hmm. And we had problems on both sides. So we had too few goods because of production problems and supply problems. We had huge demand because we had higher savings with the fact that we were sitting at home, plus we had stimulus money. Mm -hmm. And so that is starting to settle out. The big concern going into this is we would have stagflation. And so stagflation is when you have inflation, rising prices, and lower growth. We don't see that at this point. We started to see disinflation, which is a slowdown of inflation. And in some areas, you know, we just heard about housing. We we're talking about uh, the price at the pump declining. Some areas we're seeing deflation, which is a decline in prices. Yeah, and one of the things to the kind of stagflation uh, idea is we did see a, dec a small decline in real economic growth it wasn't the, the economy was growing but we also had inflation so after inflation the economy was maybe a teeny tiny bit small it's very minor and and that's the sort of thing that you you feel right if your income is going up great but if your expenses are going up faster mm, yeah then you you feel that more than you feel maybe just a modest increase of both of those so that's that's kind of the why people are saying, oh, this feels like it might be a recession. This is That's not how most economists kind of measure that. Uh, we certainly need to see more of that. We need to see more evidence. But that feeling is such a big part of it. And it's important when you're in an inflationary environment to have a really good handle on your budget, which is what mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about today, yep. because you're going to have to figure out, where can I cut back? Do I have room here to cut back? And if you've never really analyzed your income and your expenses and you hit a bump like this, it's a big deal. I've got some news that was announced last week. The 2022 Mississippi sales tax, ho uh, sales tax holiday takes place between 12.01 a.m. Friday, July 29th, uh, to 12 midnight, Saturday, July 30th. We're going to have a link to the Department of Revenue's guidelines on the information uh, for this show. So if you're interested in details on the sales tax holiday this week, uh, find the uh, uh, this episode on the archive, and we have, we'll have some information for you. So what questions do you have about budgeting? Do you need a template? Does it need to be formal? We'll talk about those sorts of things. As we also take your personal finance questions, send an email to money at mpbonline.org. We've talked about budgets frequently on the show, although I, th I think at one time, Nancy, if I remember, we, we outlawed the B word and we called them monthly we spending did. plans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because so many people just think, oh, no, a budget, I want to, I don't want to do that. I, mm -hmm. want, I don't want to have to keep up with everything. But, you know, there, there are looser ways to do it. Mm -hmm. So, Ryder, let's start out simple. What is a budget? Uh, well, try not to use that word. <laughs> it, it is a spending plan. It, it is saying this is this is what I have coming in. This is where my outflow goes. So obviously your top line income there from whatever sources you have, if you have one, two jobs, et cetera, or if you're retired, maybe you have a pension, maybe you have uh, Social Security, maybe you have some part-time income. Look at your income and then where is that money going? How much am I spending on housing? How much am I spending on food? How how much am I spending on gasoline? What am I saving? Uh, we always think of savings, especially for someone who's still working and earning, as one of the first most important parts of your budget. Of course, you, ha you have to eat, too. Mm -hmm. So, Nancy, how does budgeting help us? Oh, my goodness. Well, it um, helps with some discipline. And it uh, gives you some focus on what's important to you. You can see based on what your expenses are, 
what you really like and enjoy and where you really need to put most of your money. But more than anything, it helps you to then find a way to automatically carve out for savings. And that discipline of savings is one half of the equation as far as building wealth. So you have to save the money. You have to do it early, often, a lot to get yourself ready. And then if you put that together with investing knowledge, then you can build wealth. But really just looking out what is important to me. I, I really like that she said what is important to me because that's one of the more interesting things about going through a budgeting process with yourself is you see – how you value things. You see how you value things you spent on and you get to think about what you really value things on. And so I, I bring this up all the time, but one of my kind of biggest spending categories is, is dining out. And, and there's a lot of ways you can spend I'm, a lot I'm of... I'm thinking that might It be might change. Look, it might change. Yeah, uh, no. Nan, Nan, look, there is still takeout, Nancy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and and I, I think you might have some babysitters around the corner. <laughs> um, so what was I saying? Um, so when you're thinking about something like that, so dining out, you, maybe you look at your budget and you're like, oh, wow, I do spend a lot dining out. But all of that money is just uh, just fast food, breakfast and lunch because I can't because I'm not preparing lunch and taking it to work or something. I'm not getting the value that I want out of it. I love eating out, but I'm not I'm not enjoying those those nice long meals out with friends and family on the weekends. I'm not enjoying those things. And it, and it helps you think about how can I shift what I'm doing? And you might look at that and you might say, OK, well, I need to change something about my I don't necessarily need to change the amount I'm spending. Maybe I need to spend a little more or a little less in a category because I, I decide I I, I truly value it more than something else or less than something else. Um, but it, looking at what you're spending there, it really kind of opens up those questions about what do I truly care about? What do I truly value? What am I getting out of the money that I'm spending? So, and that changes throughout your life, absolutely. you know, um, and that's why you need to constantly come back and look at that budget or that spending plan. Um, certainly, young family like Ryder starting yeah. out, um, he and Blair, they have certain things that are important. They're going to be spending a lot more on yeah. children's Yeah, we're spending more on diapers than we were, say, <laughs> a year ago, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. That's one thing that stands out to me. Uh, uh, folks, in my age bracket, uh, we're going to be spending more on travel because that's what we're doing at this point. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a value to writing something down. I know when I was dealing with credit card uh, budgets, I mean, uh, credit card balances, I'd always think, oh, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot on that. And da, 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 you know, it's OK. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pay it off. I'll put more money in this month or whatever. But then when you actually get down and look at it, you're like, oh, my gosh, oh, look at yeah. that, how much mm -hmm. more it is. And so same thing with a budget. When you put it down on paper, you, you're you're um, your assumptions that you think in your mind disappear when it's down there on the paper. Yeah, and, and that's an important part of the process. I always think no matter how good an idea you have about your spending and, and your spending Income and your expenses, your monthly income and expenses, that's numbers you should know off the top of your head. You should know that you should be pretty familiar with that. But no matter how familiar with that you are, going through, listing your expenses, categorizing them, that every single time is going to open up, open up your eyes. So you do need to go through that process every now and then, no matter how good you are at it. If you have a question for our experts, send an email to money at mpbonline.org. We'll continue our discussion about budgets after this break. Where can you go to read about budgets? We've got some information for you next. You're listening to Money Talks on MPB Think Radio.
information presented on Money Talks is meant to provide general information about the topics discussed and is not necessarily the opinion of Mississippi Public Broadcasting. The information presented does not create any type of relationship between the hosts and guests and the listening audience. Please consult a financial advisor or any other qualified professional for guidance about your personal finance questions. I'm Professor Richard Gershon from the University of Mississippi School of Law, host of In Legal Terms. If you're enjoying this podcast, I encourage you to listen to In Legal Terms, the show about you and your rights. We find interesting legal topics to bring to you and let you know how the law affects you. Find In Legal Terms on any podcasting platform on your smart device or on our website, inlegalterms.mpbonline.org. You're listening to Money Talks. Our website, moneytalks.mpbonline.org, is one way to hear past Money Talks broadcasts. You can also download the MPB Public Media app and listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand to all the local MPB Think Radio programs. Kevin Farrell here, along with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. If you'd like to read what to know and do about budgets, visit the website consumer.gov. Before we jump back into our conversation about uh, budgets, we do have an email here that says, I've greatly enjoyed the show for many years. Thanks for your efforts on the show. It's full of useful information. When I saw you were going to have an episode on inflation, I was excited. However, it didn't necessarily seem to cover some of the topics I was hoping to hear addressed. So the question is this, why is taxation never mentioned anywhere I can see in coverage of inflation news? Uh, Roddy, you want first crack at that? Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm interested in this. And, and so at first when I saw this, I thought, okay, well, taxation, inflation. So, well, if your goods go up, you pay more sales tax. Sure. Also, there are inflation adjustments on tax brackets. But he did give us a little more color in his email. And he talked about just broad economic management. Is We often look at the Federal Reserve as responsible for that. But he said the government... So I'm guessing he's saying Congress does have the ability also to remove currency from circulation via taxation. I think that's an important point. And one of the things I've been thinking about recently is, and I've pulled up the quote here, a lot of times when we talk about inflation, people pull out the Milton Friedman quote about inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. I'm going to stop right there before I finish the rest of that. And so monetary versus fiscal. So fiscal is usually when we're talking about the fiscal spending, Congress setting a budget, that is a fiscal policy. And then monetary policy is just the supply of money in the economy that is done by the Fed. So people see that. What I think happens too often is people see that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And they stop right there and they think, okay, it's monetary. Therefore, it's the Fed's responsibility. But what he is saying that, well, the, the, the Congress, through their fiscal policy, also has the ability to take money out of the system. They can, they can help with inflation some. And so the rest of that quote is, in the sense that it can, is and can be produced only by a more rapid increase in the quantity of money than in output. So again, we can remove some of that money. And just like you saw Congress actually putting more money into the economy with stimulus, they can also take some of that money out by taxes. So that's something I find but that that's not politically I, and he he yeah. does say he does yeah. say I recognize this is politically yeah. unpopular. We're not reading the whole email. It's a nice it's a nice full page. Maybe we'll have to uh, print it in the in the newspaper or something. Um, and so he does say it feels inc- incorrect and misleading to hear economic coverage placing all the onus for inflation management on the Fed. Um, this I mean he's saying all the things I, we haven't really talked about this much on the show, uh, but this is something that we do look at and we do talk about and and just want to give you uh, one example so for instance so taxes can discourage a behavior. If One of the ideas behind cigarette taxes is we slap an extra dollar or two on the price of a cigarette pack and that discourages people from smoking and what you could do with a tax is if the price of something is rising too much you can just 
using taxes, raise it to its where it's raise the price of something to where it's just unpalatable, where people will just say, I just have to stop buying vehicles that uh, have low gas mileage, and, and that would encourage uh, less gasoline consumption. You could tax some behavior that is getting out of hand in order to rein it back. Um, as far as you know, how well done is this, how well studied is this, I, I'm not so sure. But a, a counterexample that we're seeing is actually <laughs> people talking about doing the opposite. Uh, many state, I, I hear bits and pieces, state legislatures na nationally, people talk about eliminating the gas tax to make gas cheaper. But all that's going to do is make gas more appealing to buy. It's going to help. If somebody was turned off because it went up 10 or 20, 20, 10 or 20 cents, taking the gas tax, 18 cents off, is going to encourage that purchase again. It's, it's not going to lower the price of gas. It's just going to increase the demand for that gas. Well, and certainly when we're talking about Congress, uh, they have the tendency to do what gets them reelected, which is to lower taxes. Mm -hmm. And so lower taxation and even going back to stimulus payments that we received during the pandemic, those are fueling inflation mm -hmm. because we have more money to spend. The talk of decreasing the uh, fuel tax most people are buying uh, gasoline to get around, so that may filter to other things that they buy. So you're talking about overall inflation increase. And um, even in California, they're talking about subsidies to households mm -hmm. to address inflation. That doesn't make sense. You're putting more money into the system, which is only going to fuel rising prices. Mm -hmm. Now, can they go the other way? Yes. Will they go the other way? Not on your life. Yeah, and and so one of the things that that he says in the email, it's he says one thing he says is citizens could be encouraged towards growing victory gardens. Oh, I, well, we might have a big inflation in, in gardening products if we do that. But um, he says it seems like a time when we could all be doing our part as a team of Americans, but instead we're just watching for quarterly reports from the Fed chair, and that's something very interesting. Everyone seems to have outsourced the job of inflation management to this single person to this single committee and one of the things and i believe we talked about this as the price of gas rose is that we have become over the past two years really good at not needing so much gas we have become really good at doing remote work i can cut my personal gas consumption by about 20 percent by working from home one day a week i can cut my gas consumption by combining trips um and and at a time when gas prices were rising dangerous inflation the 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 government the president was talking about trying to lower this inflation. It's, it's a real issue. We also have CEOs encouraging folks to get back to work in person. And if the message had been something more along the lines, like he's saying, hey, let's all try to use a little more gas. The, the, the Jimmy Carter lowering the speed limit on the on the interstate to, what was it, from 70 to 55. To 55. Yeah. So as a way to save gas, um, look, just encourage people to continue working remotely. Um, discourage. We just talked about flying. That is an enormous use of, of fuel. Discourage flying in some way. Of course, flying still has to take place. Plenty of people still need to drive. And, and I do think that, that some help for folks who must drive does make sense because you want to ease pain for those folks, but at the same time, you have to do something to, to lower the cost generally for folks. So I think he's absolutely right. We've mentioned some of these things in a couple of ways, but again, as he points out, this, this, this hey, everyone, we need to tighten our belts a little bit, or hey, we're going to raise tax on this to discourage it. It's incredibly unpopular. I've talked to you. It's un-American. It's un-American. We're, we're, we're driving. 
driving <laughs> more miles in bigger vehicles than ever before. And it seems to me like it used to be when gas prices went up, uh, you would see folks uh, you know, driving driving smaller cars and uh, small cars uh, would well, be popular. No, they're not I these think days. A lot of electric cars, you know. They are. It, uh, there are a few. They're coming out. They're, they're getting there. Is, is increasing. It's mm-hmm. now up to 3%. Mm-hmm. And uh, Mississippi is not in the bottom as far as the states that are adopting. Um, mm-hmm. We're sort of in the middle of the pack. So people are going electric. We'll continue our discussion on budgets in just a bit. If you're enjoying this show, we've got a suggestion for another podcast episode to listen to. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB public media app. Money Talk is MPB Think Radio's personal finance broadcast. Kevin Farrell here along with Dr. Nancy Lotridge-Anderson, president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. They're both chartered financial analysts. Ryder holds the Certificate in Investment Performance Measurement from the CFA Institute. Sometimes it takes hearing a message a few times for it to take hold. If you need to hear more and a little bit different information about budgets, listen to the September 7, 2019 podcast of Money Talks titled Money Talks Budgets. So we are talking about budgets today, and a a budget-related email has come in. This one says, we've just recently retired and moved to Mississippi. We've been hearing a lot about the dangers of using a debit card. We've always done a budget spreadsheet, but are now trying to figure out how to switch from paying as we go with a debit card to paying everything with a credit card. Any suggestions on how to switch to that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, So first, Kevin and I were just talking about the dangers. What do they mean by dangers? The general idea is just if somebody gets a hold of your debit card number, debit card, they have access to your money. If somebody gets a hold of your credit card, they have access to American Express's money. And your bank doesn't really care if somebody else is spending your money, but American Express certainly does care if someone is spending their money in an authorized manner. Their fraud detection and their their the way they chase down things, the extra protections you get, it is just it is not matched inherently is not matched uh, by a debit card. Uh, Stick to using your debit card to get cash when you need it. Uh, We do hear all the time about folks uh, swiping a card. You hear particularly things like gas stations, kind of outdoor terminals, folks getting a number taken. Uh, Go ahead, Nancy. Well, and, and the debit card, and I've had this experience before, too, where somebody got my debit card, And certainly there is recourse. I went back to my bank and I could say, look, that was not me. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, that money is gone from my account Mm -hmm. because it happens immediately. Mm -hmm. Now, I got it back, but it took about three months. Mm -hmm. With a credit card, I can dispute that because I'm not – the money's not coming out of my account. I am getting a loan every time I swipe that credit card. And I can say, that's not me. I will not pay that loan. And they will stop everything and wait for the investigation to take place. So there's Mm -hmm. plenty of protection there. Also, credit cards often will offer special warranties on items that you purchase. Um, So there are advantages on that side, too. So I tend to use my credit card. You just have to be careful. I stick to one main card I use, Mm -hmm. and I monitor everything that comes through. But I just need to know when I get to the end of the month, I've got to write a big check to cover all of that. Yeah. Like we say all of the time, credit cards are a tool for your spending. As long as you're paying that off, you're not incurring those high 
high interest charges. You kind of get to float those expenses. Money is not coming out of your bank account every single day. You don't have to kind of watch it and monitor it so much. You just do it once a month. You have a little grace period there. And also, in, in addition to all the kind of personal liability spending protections that you get with credit cards, many of them also have with their uh, your online account access, they have a lot of... Uh, cool spending analysis tools. So when you're talking about your budgeting, the, uh, this person they've obviously they're they're pretty good with that. They do it in a spreadsheet. They're, it sounds like they're they're checking on their expenses every month. We're not all doing that. And so being able to look, my credit card sends me a. I can look on a monthly basis, but they also send like a more detailed annual wrap up where my money went, how much I spent, was it unusual, etc. A couple of things. So for the emailers, if they're switching to it, if it would be if you're dis- – and that's the, the, the point I would make. You have to be disciplined in the fact that, as Nancy mentioned, when you use a credit card, it's a loan. Mm-hmm. Well, if you take out a loan all month and then at the end of the month you think, oh, well, look, you know, and you uh, don't pay uh-huh. it off, yep. that's where you're going to yep. get in trouble. Yep. It's a tool. Big charges. As long charges. As, is, but, uh, I mean, for this emailer in particular, they're already good with it, but I'm not, I'm not worried about that. They're, they're not saying, can I spend twice as much money if I put it on a credit card? And that's the important thing. Never spend more than you can pay off today. But if they have a good idea, say they spend $1,000 a month, they have a good idea. Well, then instead of needing to watch their bank account every day to say, oh, well, we spent a lot of money today, a little money yesterday, et cetera, et cetera, they just need to know, you know come the end of the month, come when that, that credit card is due, we need to have, I mean, I would say you'd be more comfortable with a lot more than just that spending amount, but that's the amount you need to have in there at that moment. Um, and as far as how to switch to it, if you already have a credit card, you're already happy with your credit card, just start pulling it out more often. Also, if you don't have a credit card and you have a good credit score, boy, they're going to come. Uh, they'll, they'll be they beating want your you. door down trying they to get you want to sign you. up. Absolutely. Uh, one final thing. If you have a debit card and you swipe it, a lot of times you can pick credit or debit. If you choose credit, are you getting any? Choose credit. You are getting the protections of a credit card then? I don't, I, don't, I don't know that there's significant difference. I know one main difference is that you don't have to put your PIN number in. Well, and the, there is another difference. We need to point this out for um, vendors and retailers. When you swipe that card and you use a debit card, it costs them less mm. than if you use a credit card, about half as much. Mm. And so, you know, that that's the one area where I, where I will think twice. Uh, if I have local retailers, I will often opt for my debit card. Because you, can write, I know you can write them a check, Nancy. Well, I don't usually you, keep my you check can, in you can my pull out your pull out your coin anymore. pull out your coin purse and count it out for him. Cash? What? I forgot about that. A check? What is this check thing you speak of? I don't think yeah, I've had a check. I, in... I read about it in a history book. <laughs> it was uh, is in the middle school curriculum actually. All right, we've got a caller on the line. I think that wants to continue our discussion that we had about inflation. But let's invite Ooh. Charlie from Tupelo to the air. Good morning, Charlie. Go ahead. A little late, so I was just listening to the conversation about taking the money back out of the economy for the inflation. And this is my my point of it that I've just seen through my business is that money that comes out of the economy through taxation mm-hmm. never stays out of the economy. Every government contract we've ever dealt with, they were always waiting for the next, you know, that next, you know, fix of money to mm-hmm. come through. To be able to, you know, they have so many other plans. Mm -hmm. I don't think that actually takes money out of the economy. It's not like they're taking it and putting it in a lockbox to lower the amount of cash Mm -hmm. that's available. Am am I not correct on that? That is true. Um, And, of course, that goes back to Congress and their tendency to not only spend everything that they collect, but spend more more than they collect, which is why we have um, the amount of debt that we have. Right. And so you are correct that money that's coming in is going back out. It's circulating uh, to something else we don't know. And whatever that money is spent on, that's where you might see some rise in prices. Uh, One point I would 
add to that kind of in favor of the you know targeted taxes to cut inflation in certain in certain spots is one it can remove it from certain areas so when we say we have 9.1 percent inflation it does not mean that every single price tag in America has been adjusted you know you didn't scratch it out and write plus 9.1 percent it means that gas has doubled it means that uh, I was looking at it earlier medical equipment has gone up by four percent it means that you know, food away from home is up by 30 percent and that grocery store food is up by 10 percent it's it's all over the board and so if you have if you target specific things again thinking a lot about uh, f- fuel purchases if you targeted say gasoline then you could potentially lower that price of gasoline by reducing the demand for that specific thing also if that did lead to less like nancy said congress tends to spend more than they take in if that led to less of that excess borrowing than that would be overall a fewer dollars uh, and also some of that is moving dollars into the future because they have to collect it and then spend it and also putting that money back into different areas so which may not be as inflationary and that comes back to why taxation is not a good way to deal with inflation, because, you know, Congress um, never met a budget excess that they didn't like to just turn around and write a check for. It, it, it is a lot more – you could theoretically have a much more fine-tuned approach than this single tool the Federal Reserve has. Well, I mean, they have like two tools at this point, but – those are very blunt instruments, whereas specific yeah. taxes, potentially in a well-studied way, which we don't have. Which also brings up something called elasticity, which is how um, – what kind of impact uh, that change in prices has on demand. So if you are a cigarette smoker, you smoke two packs a day, then that is very inelastic, meaning if the price goes up, you're still going to buy two packs a day. Um, Other things, you might think, I don't need that. I can uh, live without that or I can find a substitute. Then those things are more elastic in their pricing. I agree. All right. Charlie, thanks for the call this morning. This is... Uh, uh, money talks on MPB Think Radio. We're talking a little bit about budgets this morning. Uh, so, Nancy, um, how do you start a budget? Well, you start by looking at your expenses, and uh, certainly your income has to be part of that, but that's usually a standard one that most people know pretty quickly. Um, I usually tell people to go back a year because in your budget, you're going to have things that are, you know, they don't happen every month. Certainly, if you're paying rent or a mortgage payment or utilities, those are monthly expenses, and you can see those very clearly. But you may have a a once-a-year insurance bill or medical expenses that vary throughout the year. So going back a year and looking at your bank register and seeing how, how do I spend my my money. Put that in various categories to figure out where your money is going. So, Ryder, if someone it doesn't get paid regularly, does that make budgeting a little more challenging? It certainly can, and and that is not an uncommon problem, especially if you're working part time, you're working multiple jobs, you work freelance, you're a contractor. All of those uh, folks will probably have much lumpier income. And one idea is you should still have a good idea of what you expect going forward in sort of an average, and so develop your budget based on that, and also develop your priorities. So what is the category that if your bank account gets low and you don't see money coming in in the next month, what is the first thing you cut and what is importantly the last thing you cut? It's probably of course going to going to be things like rent and utilities are the last things you cut. Your your baseline for for food expenses are going to be some of the last things you cut. Your more discretionary expenses, dining out and travel might be the first things that you cut. Uh, also just on the tools to help you side, you are going to need more of a cash cushion than most folks. If you regularly make 
$1,000 and regularly spend $900, you can you can pretty much close your eyes for the year and you're going to be fine as long as the timing of everything works out well. But if you've got lumpy income and lumpy expenses, then it's going to be a lot harder to manage and you might need to have a larger cash cushion in your bank account to feel comfortable with that. Also, like we were talking about tools for spending, a credit card is a very good tool there because you can still, you can put off actually spend, laying out the cash for something for up to about 45 days because you spend for a month and then you have about 10 to 15 days to actually pay for it. So again, you're going to have to watch that really carefully, but that is a tool to kind of level out to some extent the actual spending you do. So Nancy, I guess uh, a budget is not something set in stone and it it needs to be flexible month to month as expenses uh, maybe vary. I, I'm not going to put it quite that way. Um, I think flexible maybe year to year, but if you get too flexible month to month, pretty much you're going to end up in a hole somewhere along the way. Um, so if you have a pretty good idea over a year's time what your average expenses will be, even if you have a month where you don't make the average, you know, you don't just go, hey, it's time to have a party and um, go crazy because you know there's a bigger, as Ryder mentioned, a lumpy expense on the horizon you're going to have to cover. And if you do have a big expense, you don't panic because you know I've prepared for this. I've already figured out that I, these are my limits and everything else so that I can make this bigger payment. And, and I do think it's important, as you mentioned earlier, Nancy, to maybe that year view gives you a look in some of those annual expenses that you pay once a year that, you know, uh, if you work it into your budget, again, as you said, you don't panic when it comes up and you think, oh, my gosh, my blank bill is due or whatever. So Yeah, usually it's, a, it's an insurance bill, car mm-hmm. insurance once a quarter or a house insurance. Or your summer vacation, year. Nancy. Or your summer vacation, yes. Or the other thing is by looking at expenses over a year, it can smooth out the unexpected, you know, medical expenses. Well, we don't know how sick we're going to be during the year. Certainly the pandemic pointed out during this period of time that you can have a really big expense pop up that you didn't expect because you have always been healthy. Um, But that smooths out some of those over the year. We'll continue talking about budgets after a quick break. This is Money Talks on MPB Think Radio. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. We're glad you found our show, Money Talks. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives, and Ryder Taft, portfolio manager at New Perspectives. Here's a program reminder. Tuesdays at 10, listen live to In Legal Terms on MPB Think Radio. It always follows our show. So, Nancy, um, I uh, was telling Ryder this morning that my savings account, I got another email. It's now up to 1.15% interest, which I think is pretty oh, good. Oh, wow. What's so the more I ridicule <laughs> his savings account, the higher the rate goes. So, I, I mean, Kevin should be paying me at this point, really. And I th- yeah, those, ra- those rates are going up, and we talked uh, in an earlier show about the short-term rates are a little slower to move up. Mm-hmm. But they're happening, yeah. It, yeah, that's that's great, Kevin. I'm, I'm very I'm very excited. It'll start going We're very down. Proud. It'll start going down now that I've said that. <laughs> so, what are some reasons to have a savings account, Nancy? Oh my goodness! Uh, it keeps you from pulling out that credit card. It's where you and keep your money, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, so we always encourage people to have a good checking account that you keep enough in that checking account to cover that monthly budget amount that you know you're going to have to spend on. Um, and you also want to keep enough in there so you don't have to pay bank fees. And then um, the amounts that go over that, then move that to a good savings account. And everybody needs a good savings account. Ryder talked earlier about lumpy income. You know, if you don't get the same um, payment from your job every two weeks or every month, if you're a commission salesperson, you need to keep more in savings because your income is um, more is, is subject to changes, and uh, you're open to some problems if you don't have some money accumulated. You will always hear three to six months and I tell people that depends on again how solid your income is mm -hmm. how solid your job is mm -hmm. but everybody needs some savings to cover those emergencies because we all have them and you don't want to have to pull out a credit card and then face what we now know is an average rate of 20 percent mm. yeah and and kind of thinking about the size of your savings account that's something we talk about a lot and it's something we wrote a blog post about recently we'll get it to live is, but it that's that's a very it varies person to person so like nancy said people say oh three to six months and kind of call it a day there that's a that is a fine starting point right and that's a lot it, sometimes it, it's so much for people mm -hmm. when they hear three to six months they don't even try right but she mentioned as well how stable how secure is your income the more stable and secure it is uh, the less you need to really worry about it and i always say kind of what does an emergency look like what what does it look like the day i need to reach into this for a significant amount if it's a medical accident or uh, your house burns down or your car but you need to buy a new car what you know does, what it is right now you need to buy a plane ticket nancy no 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 it's the air conditioner going out i i have just replaced That's my air conditioner i'm gonna knock on wood that i won't have to replace that <laughs> for at least a few more days um I will have to pay for a lot of electricity as we keep that house cool, though. Um, so what do those look like? And so in addition to needing just your regular expenses, you might need to hit your insurance deductibles. So we talked about in the office, you might have somebody who they spend a thousand dollars a month but it is all non-discretionary and they have very high deductibles and so if they had an emergency they would immediately need ten thousand dollars for medical expenses or household expenses and then they need that a thousand dollars a month because they don't have a very stable job and they're very likely to lose that so six months for them would be sixteen six thousand dollars and ten thousand dollars for medical or, or, or whatever expenses then you might have someone who spends five thousand dollars a month but it's it's purely discretionary spending and they've got a super stable secure job and they've got excellent insurance coverages and even though they have five times the regular expenses they may end up looking at it and thinking maybe they need the same or even less money saved up because in a true emergency they'd be so well covered and they would still have their regular income so it is very personal that think about oh three to six months that's a target. Um, I always, always think about hit hit some arbitrary number like a thousand dollars saved, and then hit one month's expenses. You can have intermediate goals as you reach that final number. Okay, we've got about two minutes left in the show. We're going to do a little forward promotion uh, in the near future. We're going to devote an entire broadcast to this. But one tip from each of you here as we wrap up: we're looking to reduce expenses. So what is the top tip you have for reducing expenses? Go, Nancy. Stop paying for things you don't use, like your gym membership, like um, streaming subscriptions, any subscriptions that you find. I'm not using it. Pay attention. It may look like a small number, but they add up. And I've noticed there's even an app now that supposedly helps you track all those subscriptions yeah. and, and uh, lets yeah. you uh, unsubscribe to them. So, yeah, I've heard Ryder? That. So my top tip is every time you spend, to, to be a little more uh, conscientious about your spending. Every time you spend money, be it paying cash for something, swiping your card, an automatic bank draft. So you might have to do this by checking your bank transactions every day. Every time you spend money, just ref take, a, take a minute to reflect on it. And was it worth it? Am I going to be enjoying this in the future? And and you'll you can slowly shape your habits that way. 
You know, I think that's a good one because as I attempt to sort of have a more healthy diet and, and eat more healthily, it's the same sort of thing. When you stop somewhere and you think, do I really need this chocolate shake? That sort yes. of thing. So. Yes. 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 The answer is yes, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, we got an email this morning, and so I'd like to remind you of the email address. It's money at mpbonline.org. You can send it in during the program, of course, but also through the week. If you have something that comes up and you need a little financial assistance with, go ahead and send that in there. We'll sometimes share them on the air. Sometimes uh, they go directly to Ryder and uh, Nancy, uh, and they formulate a response. But we try to get you the information, whether it be calling in over the air or whether you send us an email. So that will wrap us up for today. Money Talks is a production of MPB Think radio funded in part by generous support from listeners to hear today's show or previous show you can visit moneytalks.mpbonline.org or listen to the podcast by searching for money talks on your preferred podcasting app our show is produced by liz gill and our call screener today was jermaine flood so for dr nancy lotter janderson and Ryder taff i'm kevin farrell join us tuesdays at nine for money talks it's heard only on mpb think radio